All right, let's get right back here to uh, the doctrine of God. We looked at the definition from the negative standpoint. Uh, we looked at the... Um, um, we looked at the um, non-Christian worldviews, starting with atheism, agnosticism, pantheism, polytheism, dualism, deism, and monotheism. And uh, now, let's look, Roman numeral number two, at the existence of God. The existence of God. And today, we're going to use some uh, well-known... Uh, arguments for the existence of God. Uh, these are not the, not the best defense for the existence of God, um, but sometimes these may be helpful as a starting point for someone who uh, is an agnostic or an atheist or has rejected uh, the idea of um, uh, the, the one God of Scripture. So these may be a, a starting point. These are... Uh, <clears throat> more from a reasoning standpoint um, and a, uh, <clears throat> the idea of an um, apologetic a defense uh, of God, some, some reasoning that uh, they are true. They lead us to uh, the conclusion that there is a God. So these are um, fairly uh, widely used uh, when... Um, uh, a person is starting out. It's uh, the danger of, uh, uh, of strictly uh, apologetics is that uh, rationalism in the end uh, doesn't defeat r rationalism. It, it's the Word of God that um, is, has the power to change and alter a person's uh, soul. Um, but using God's Word in an effective way um, uh, can be helpful. And the fact of the matter is, uh, when we look at the example of Paul, he did spend a lot of time trying to persuade in the arena of ideology in those synagogues. Okay? He spent a lot of time there reasoning and, and, and convincing, and some that um, were um, pretty wise people were convinced. And, and persuaded uh, by uh, that. So uh, Paul was a, a little, um, tended to be a, a little bit more explanatory when he was at Athens because he was in a place that didn't have a starting point for uh, the God of Scripture. Letter A, the cosmological argument, C-O- S M O L O G I C A L cosmological argument. This means cause and effect. This argument says um, <clears throat> the universe is an effect which demands an adequate cause. So here we have this universe. We see it. There has to be a cause uh, behind that. So this idea, the cosmological argument, says God exists and is that first cause. All right, this is often where we find ourselves when we, when we are thinking about uh, the issue of evolution and creation. The evolutionist can only go so far back until they have to answer the question, what was the first, what was there, what started it all? And if that that started it all is not a personal God, then whatever started it all or existed is God or is supreme. Uh, and so this takes us all the way back uh, to what started it all. Where, where did If we see all this, where did it come from? Cause and effect. The first cause is God. That's what this argument states. All right, so what about, what will people say about the existence of the universe? Some, some might say that nature is eternal, all right, and its forms has, has existed forever. Some, some would say that. That's a reasoning that uh, man would, would use. Uh, matter, matter has existed forever. Matter is eternal. 
Matter is eternal, but God has taken that eternal matter and arranged it. So, so God is involved with this eternal matter. That would be uh, uh, the philosophy of the, of the Greeks before the time of Christ. Plato and Aristotle would have had God interacting with this eternal matter, arranging it, uh, in ordering it. Matter is eternal. And so, um, the um, validity of this argument is based on three things, okay? If we say God is the first cause, um, <clears throat> this argument is valid based on these three truths. First, every effect must have a cause, okay? Every effect must have a cause. And secondly, that effect depends on on that cause for existence. Whatever that effect or result is depends on that cause for its existence. And thirdly, nature cannot produce itself. Nature can't just be eternal. What is nature then? What is it? What was it? There's, those are uh, questions that are uh, un unanswerable. Um, going all the way back to the first cause. So you can see how that could be an effective defense for uh, God. All right, let's get all the way back to the original uh, cause. And then um, the description of this cause, this first uh, being, uh, we would say uh, these things. Number one, it's something. That cause has to be something. It has to have a real existence can't be nothing because we see this effect. What, what is that? Uh, if it has to be something, it has to be real. And then secondly, whatever this first cause is must have something in its nature which accounts for the effect that we see. Whatever that cause is, first cause, has to have something in its nature uh, that relates to or accounts for what we see here as the effect, the effect. What are we talking about with regard to the effect? We're talking about human beings. We're talking about uh, uh, nature. We're talking about the stars. We're talking about uh, geography. We're talking about air. We're talking about the order of life. Whatever that first cause is, has something in its nature uh, that uh, accounts for what we see now. And then thirdly, uh, the efficiency of its effects must be adequate. The efficiency of its effects must be adequate. In other words, that cause has to have the ability to produce the effects, the cause, the, 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 the results. Okay, so there has to be, in other words, that cause has to be powerful enough to produce what the effects are. Now, what that does not do necessarily, that what that argument does not do necessarily is point us to the God of the Bible, okay? But it does point us to a first cause, and um, it makes that cause not nature, but some type of person, and it makes that uh, cause uh, personal and powerful, and whatever we see today, the effect, we can assume that that cause has uh, all to do with that. All right, so uh, that is the cosmological argument, the argument of cause and effect. Uh, a uh, medieval theologian of sorts, uh, about a thousand years ago, was the first one to uh, uh, really push uh, that argument. Okay, any questions about the cosmological argument? Cause and effect. We're going all the way back. And we're learning things about whatever the cause is from the things that we see today, the effect. Secondly, the teleological argument, T-E-L-E-O, and then the word logical. If you're not sure how to spell that, it's, it's just logical. There we go, teleological argument. 
And uh, <clears throat> T-E-L-E, -E, transliteration from, uh, from a Greek word that has the idea of uh, purpose or the end. Uh, the, 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 uh, the result. <clears throat> so this somewhat builds upon the cosmological argument and uh, it goes a step further and it focuses in on the fact that this result, the effect that we see all of nature and man uh, has a definite specific design. Such specificness and detail in this design has to come from a personal intelligent designer. All right, have you heard that argument recently in the um, public arena, right? Intelligent design. And uh, again, intelligent design, um, it's good as far as it goes doesn't, don't confuse though intelligent design with creationism, okay, uh, that, that uh, would uh, be a biblical um, view of God as our creator. Intelligent design, um, it, it would be like this, so here is uh, uh, intelligent design, all right, so ID, creationism is in that. But a person can believe in intelligent design without believing in God of the Scripture as being the Creator. Intelligent design. <clears throat> Let's turn to Psalm 94, 9. Psalm 94, 9. Robert, we'll have you read that. 9 and 10. Psalm 94, 9 and 10. He that planted the ear shall he not hear. He that formed the eye shall he not see. He that chastises the heathen shall he not shall not he correct. He that teaches man knoweth not. He that teaches man knowledge shall he not know. Okay, good. All right. All right. Remedial reading class for you. <laughs> walk in the library. Head left. Take another left. Sit in a circle. <laughs> Miss Groves will read for you, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> and uh, so uh, your challenge there to uh, pronounce the word knowledge uh, correctly next class. Um, you got to meet people where they're at, I'm told, and so um, <clears throat> not assuming anything in this class. Um, all right, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> you did get the silent K, though, at the start of that word. Congratulations <laughs> on that. Um, Mrs. Knowles would be happy. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've used a study Bible before, and I've not followed through on this, but uh, it and others have challenged people to look up what the idea of planting the ear physiologically means. Okay, physiologically, planting the ear. Okay, so that's your challenge. Can I tell you what it means? Because I haven't done it. Maybe someone will find that out and share with us. Next class period, maybe the tense humiliation of one Robert Dupre will drive him to prove us all wrong. Bring back a 15-page paper on the planted ear by Robert Dupre. So we have an ear, but you've looked at the ear. I mean, uh, studied it. I mean, looked at it, but you studied it. I mean, that, that's amazing. Just an ear is amazing, right? The details. Right? We have the outer, the middle, and the inner ear, right? Our balance is in our ear. We've got like iron work, right? The hammer, the anvil. What, what else is in there? The scythe, chainsaw, I mean, all those like power tools and stuff, all inside the ear. You didn't know that. That's probably what they're talking about right there. The ear is a miraculous, miraculously functioning uh, part of our body, and that's just one part. We have two of those. And, and what about the eye? What about the eye? Uh, <clears throat> uh, when I was in college, I can't quote the plate, can't give you the source or anything. I just remember the stat. 
um, <clears throat> an evolutionist said the chances of the eye of a horse developing through the process of evolution is 10 to the 15th power. That's the eye of one horse. Might as well go play the lottery, you know what I'm saying? Like I did not. <laughs> Play the lottery, but you got good chance, better chances there than for uh, 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 to believe in evolution. We laugh about the lottery, people do, and, uh, but they teach evolution. What's what's more absurd logically? Well, that's that's a big number, and that's one eye from a horse. Um, because verse nine says God formed the eye. He formed the eye. Last night in our institute class, we talked about God's specific creation from conception of every individual person from, from Scripture. Every individual person uniquely, not just uh, worked, but wrought. That's to work with skill and purpose, uh, wrought by God, every one of us, unique unique, some more unique than others, no doubt, you two in there, <laughs> anyway, the ear, the eye, I mean, that, that alone, we have people that dedicate their entire life to just working with people's eyes, uh, so this is um, a design that demands a designer, Right? So, um, <clears throat> it's a great verse. The fact of design is exhibited in every created thing. Every created thing exhibits design. Talk to the farmer, and he can talk to you for days and days about the miracle of the production of uh, growing corn. Talk to the person who, who, who works with animals. They will talk about the uniqueness and the distinctiveness of all the different uh, uh, cre uh, creatures that, that, that they deal with. Talk to the botanist and they'll talk forever about the wonders of just plant life. Talk to biologists. Um, all these things are, uh, go along with this idea of this detailed, obvious design has to have a uh, designer. <clears throat> All right, let's look at Acts 14.15. Acts 14.15. All right, uh, Acts 14.15. All right, uh, Robert, redeem thyself. Acts 14, 15. Take a deep breath. Focus, pull out those phonics flashcards real quick. C says, cousin, cat. C says, cousin, cat. You can do it. We're all behind you. But we also are very wa watching very closely for any slip-up so we can laugh hysterically at you. <laughs> Is everybody ready? Watching closely? Okay. All right, go ahead. And same, sirs. Why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. So uh, here we have. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna hack you up here in just a minute. Here we're gonna, we're gonna let you have it there. <clears throat> Yeah, the commas uh, breaks. Uh, yeah, were a little, little uh, same as the break for the colons and the question marks. You need to put a little more expression into there too. The spirit of Dr. Johnson following you. <laughs> All right, so here's uh, Paul. Um, 
you know, they're calling him Mercur Mercurius. They're calling him Mercury, and they're calling Barnabas Jupiter. One little thing, it's interesting, at this time, first missionary journey, uh, Barnabas was Jupiter, Paul was Mercury. You know who Jupiter was or represented or was comparable to? The, 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 the overall, the main god, the, 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 big, the big mythological god was Jupiter. And Mercury was not. Mercury was b beneath that speaker here. Uh, they they uh, point that out. So Jupiter is Zeus, and uh, Mercury is uh, Hermes, the mess and just the messenger of the gods. So it's interesting that first missionary journey, Barnabas, at least in this city, was looked at as the, the main man. Paul was the speaker. So it's a little note there. <clears throat> Uh, interesting point. Anyway, so here in comes uh, <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas, and uh, man, rather than get worshipped and be called these uh, these uh, mythological uh, gods, the uh, Rome, the Greek gods, they say uh, about the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are. Uh, that are therein. All right, so uh, this is um, uh, not just the design of nature, but interaction with civilization. Verse 16, who in time past suffered all nations to walk their own ways. Uh, <clears throat> but the design, even when all nations were suffered to walk in their own ways, they had the testimony of God, His purpose, His design. Look at verse 17. He left not Himself without witness, and that He did good, and gave rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Those definitely go together, don't they? Food, gladness, gladness, food. It's all just like interchangeable parts right there. Food and gladness. Verse 18, And with these saints, scarce for staying the people, they had not done sacrifice unto them. Design, the great design uh, in this uh, world. Thirdly, anthropological argument. Anthro, A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, the anthropological argument. Anthropological, of course, deals with man, but the part of man that uh, would be defined as uh, <clears throat> moral, the conscience, or the feeling of guilt. Moral, uh, the work of conscience, and the feeling of guilt that is in um, men. So... Man's actual constitution, his makeup, um, is evidence for uh, God. Man's soul is not self or society imposed. It's not created by material. We didn't get born and then go to the soul shop. Well, you might have went there, but you shouldn't have. Uh, <laughs> you didn't get your soul from there though. The soul comes with us. And what does our soul do? Even among the lost, okay, it can bring, it can bring uh, shame and guilt and can be a moral uh, outlook. Who gave man this guide? Who gave man the guide of conscience? Who, where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? All right. <clears throat> So our conscience can uh, excuse or conde condemn us. All right. Letter D. <coughs> Letter D. The ontological argument. O n t o. Ontological argument. This I this has to do with that there is an idea of God in man. 
There's an idea of God in man. Many Native Americans uh, never had uh, scripture, but they knew there was a great spirit, right? And they have certainly, their, uh, certainly their uh, uh, worship um, was recognizing design and purpose in things. Uh, misguided, for sure. And uh, uh, not uh, based on scriptural revelation of God. Uh, but the idea of God uh, is found uh, across society. <clears throat> so this argument <clears throat> um, to the existence of God is bolstered by the fact that the human mind believes that he does exist. The human mind believes that he does exist. Letter E, the ethnological argument. E-T-H-N-O-L-O-G-I-C-L, -O -O ethnological, uh, ethnological, ethnological. All right, Robert, I'll join you there after class. <laughs> I thought I was going to escape. Save me a chair. Um, ethnological argument, all right. And this sort of goes back to the idea of God traced historically. Different ethnic groups, or the Greek word uh, ethos, uh, the nations, the various nations. We go to various nations, and in those nations, historically, there's a universal sense of some God. So the idea of God existent historically proven across different ethnic groups. Where the Greeks wanted to worship gods, didn't they? They wanted to worship gods. They had all these statues. And the Rome, Rome, uh, Rome wanted to uh, uh, worship some greater being. Letter F, or 6, is the scriptural argument. The scriptural argument. Uh, now, what about Scripture and the evidence existence of God? Um, th three passages here that, that I like to look at, and, and uh, if you've been in one of my classes for a while, you've already heard this, uh, but let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And here's, here's about the extent of what the Bible does in order to try to prove the existence of God. It goes like this, verse 1, in the beginning, God. So it does give us a prepositional phrase, in the beginning, but the fourth word of Scripture is already assuming that God uh, is. And then we learn about Him throughout Scripture. Okay, That is God's inspired words given to Moses... <clears throat> Uh, from the very start of Scripture. Then, to the passage we just read, back to Acts chapter 14. Here, Paul and Barnabas are in um, Lystra and Derby, And uh, here they are <clears throat> dealing with... Uh, uh, one that's healed gets up, verse 11, Acts 14, 11, they see what's done. Uh, the gods, here we go, the gods are come down to us. So these are uh, the, the pagan, Greek, Roman gods. It's what the people believed. And, and Paul then answers in verse 15 with God, the living God, as creator. Okay, so... Paul knew Genesis 1.1. He knew that God created. So here in Acts 14, verse 15, he does the same thing that happens in Genesis 1. He assumes the uh, existence of God. But the, the first trait or first act that he uses when he is 
speaking of God to people that were polytheists was God is creator. And, and then we see the same thing there in uh, Acts chapter 17. Let's look there. Acts chapter 17 and verse 22. So here we've got um, a uh, uh, superstitious group of people here in, uh, in Athens. Um, he says, you're too superstitious, verse 23, for I passed by and uh, beheld your uh, devotions. I, I, I saw what you worship, that's devotion, your object of worship. So you have devotions in the morning. Really, that is a time of, I mean, it's the same word as the time of worship. So the devotions here were these objects of worship. He saw them, he saw lots of them, and he saw one to an unknown God. So he said, I'm going to tell you about him. Verse 24, God, there's God, assumed, not defended, assumed, and then God as what? Creator. Do you see that? See that in verse 24? God that made the world. Acts chapter, um, uh, Acts chapter 14, God um, <clears throat> made heaven and earth and sea. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God. So the scriptural argument is this, God exists, and scripture tells us all about him. That's the scriptural argument, God exists, and in the... Three times when uh, Genesis 1 1, let's take that out, the, twice at least here when uh, polytheists or um, uh, people that followed wrong gods were confronted, Paul said, God is the creator. All right, and then <clears throat> lastly here, letter G, is what is called the congruity argument. The congruity argument, congruity, uh, things work together, things fit together. This idea is uh, God, the God of Scripture, is the key that opens all the locks. All the questions, all the questions can be answered by accepting the truth that the God uh, uh, of the Bible is the one true God. And so this idea is the key uh, that opens all the locks, the theory that answers all the questions. Uh, it's faith, but it's not blind faith. It's faith in God's revealed Word. And uh, please understand that uh, there is no truth to the argument that uh, ridiculing Christians uh, for just living by faith. Everybody on earth lives by faith in something. Everybody does. The evolutionist is, is living by, by faith. He's just um, either sincerely wrong some or some are deliberately uh, worshiping man. And in the end, that's what's going to be the end of uh, the world, is the exaltation of man in, in the book of Revelation. All right? It's no uh, wonder that humanism, uh, secularism, is, is what's on the rise. Everyone is their own god. Um, uh, really, the, the last two years, the conversations that uh, we've had with our uh, sixth and seventh grade bus riders is very different from the conversations uh, e even before that. N not that um, th the world has was all of a sudden became unholy the last two years, um, but just this direct contradiction of obvious teachings of Scripture embraced by uh, the the sixth and seventh and, and eighth graders. Um, uh, through what is uh, forced on them through their school is um, surprising how quickly um, that uh, can take place. And it's all 
revolves around <clears throat> the, um, the elevation of man and whatever man wants to do, the removal of uh, moral absolutes. Okay. Now, it's, it's a long time coming, all right? It's, it's certainly in, in America, uh, uh, it's a long time coming. There was a, uh, it got very open and bold in uh, the music and the culture of the, of the 1960s when there was a deliberate uh, 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 admiration and lifting up of rebellion and the start of the idea of the teenager. It used to be two distinctions for, uh, uh, for, for boys. There were boys, and then the next stop was a young man. A boy then became a young man. Now we have the idea of boy, teenager. And teenager, we take, need to take the word teen off that because that means it ends at 19. That ain't always the case, is it? Uh, sometimes teen, uh, whatever that part of life consists of, like age and some ability without responsibility, it's getting older and older, isn't it? I mean, <clears throat> boys, I don't know if you're in the session or not, but uh, the idea of uh, boys that soon Soon in life, they need to learn they're the ones that put a roof over the family's head. They're the ones who puts the food on the table. Their job. Their job to do that. Um, and not to make excuses for it. And to do whatever is necessary to put the roof over the top of the head and to pay the bills and to put the food on the table. That's the boy's job. Um, but this uh, really... Uh, fun little stage in life where the roof is already put over top of the head, the food's already on the table, and uh, why well, like this, let's just keep this going till 25, 30, 35. And my purpose, I'm telling you, I had a good week because I got to level eight of psycho smash the tank into the kamikaze boat video game. I'm at level eight. I had a guy proud, proud, proud of what he had accomplished on Saturday. Proud about it. He wanted to tell me all about it. How was your week? It was <laughs> serious. 30-year-old man. 30-year-old man. I got to level whatever, and I'm playing with people from all over the pl place. I'm like, uh, here's a Bible verse. Try to come to church tomorrow. Let's, uh, let, let's, uh, See if, uh, see if we can let that, uh, let that uh, down for a little bit. It's tough. It's tough. You know, Obama changed, of course, the age, <clears throat> you know, uh, the age of uh, insurance and all that up to 26. You know, it's easy just, though, for go along with culture. You're not helping our boys when we don't tell them. You, you're putting the roof over your, it's your job. But, but, well, you'll learn. If you have to do it, you will learn. So, ladies, it would be fun to be a mom, but make sure that your boys know their job and you're helping them do their job. All right. So here we here we are. <clears throat> here we are with a, a society where kids don't even know what they really are gender-wise now. Right? They don't even know. We're, 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 how dare we tell them that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> boys on this side, girls on that side. Well, that's that's a given, right? That that's not going to be a problem. I mean. In a junior church, boys on this side, it'll be a problem. It'll be a problem. So, um, uh, the elevation of man, the removal of moral absolutes, turns a society into chaos. And so you have the great Roman Empire that 
declined and fell when no one thought it ever was going to fall. Why? Because man and flesh was uh, living and existing apart from a moral, absolute right and wrong, acceptable, unacceptable. And so down, down it went. Um, not that it was founded uh, uh, on the Bible, the Roman Empire, um, but uh, God sees to it that uh, it doesn't matter the empire that, that uh, is, is uh, rejecting him uh, is going to, to pay the price. And, uh, uh, you know, America, it's, it's not, there's no scriptural uh, mandate that it is uh, eternal, right? <clears throat> so, uh, so here we have these uh, arguments uh, for God, and, and they may be a helpful starting place uh, to engage someone uh, about uh, God, but uh, I just remind you here from Scripture uh, Paul, Paul pretty much went right into the fact, here's God, hey, He's the Creator. And, and here's some things as Creator that He is expecting from you. Could be that someone's just never heard someone that really believed in the God of the Bible. And when they hear someone say that and believe it, God's uh, Word can change their heart. All right, and just stick with it. All right, uh, uh, we're here because there's still lost souls that want to hear. Okay, that's what we're here for, and we want to be telling them. All right, so uh, we looked at uh, Roman numeral number one, then the definition of God, Roman numeral number two, the existence of God, and uh, <clears throat> what we'll look at next uh, class period is the nature of God uh, <clears throat> with regard to his spirituality, his personality, and his unity of essence. And then uh, a week from today, <laughs> we will look at the doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, what an uh, um, immense, um, uh, miraculous, uh, amazing truth that that is. Uh, and then uh, we will end with two class periods on the attributes uh, of God. All right, so we will see you then on Tuesday. <laughs>